Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for you. Thank you for just who you are as our God and the fact that you are a God of grace, a God of mercy, a God that we can live for you, Lord. Lord, I ask as we, we dive into your word that you just come, fill us with the Holy Spirit. You come convict us, teach us, guide us, that your word just goes out in just such power, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we are moving through the Bible with our They Lived It series, we have gone through some of the most recognizable characters in the entire Bible, where we've seen you know, characters like Adam and Eve and Moses and David and all these other characters guys that we kind of have a good idea from. And now we're moving towards some characters that are a little less known. Last week, we look at Jehoshaphat, which just has a great name to say, as we learned last week. But we're looking at characters like how many of us really have studied the life of some of the kings? So we're coming to a point where we're looking at the kingdoms and we're looking at some of the kings that are sticking out in the Bible. So today we're actually going to look at a southern king because Jehoshaphat was a northern king or Israel king. And we're going to look at a king of Judah and his name is Hezekiah. Hezekiah is a very special king. And the reason he's such a special king is because if you go to Israel, you can walk through his tunnel. And that's really what people know Hezekiah for. He was a man that during the uproar of the time frame, which was wars and battles and sieges, where armies would come outside the gate of Israel, as we're going to see, and they would just camp there. And all of uh, people in Jerusalem had to just sit there and wait to die because it's called siege warfare. And Hezekiah was a guy that built a tunnel from a water source outside of the gates to the city of David, and he did it as an engineering feat. And that's really what we kind of know Hezekiah as. This guy that built this tunnel that you can walk through if you go to Israel. It's a lot of fun, really dark, and there's water up to your calves as you do it. But it's an amazing tunnel because it still works. But Hezekiah has so much more to him. He is a man, he is a king that followed the Lord and he's also a king that God answered amazing prayers for. He's one of those kings that we look at and we go, wow, God, you really did this for this man. And we actually get to see how Hezekiah lived. We're going to be looking at Hezekiah's life, life through the, the lens of 2 Kings chapter 20, but we have to start at, his, at the beginning of 2 Kings chapter 18, and this is what it says. And it came to pass that Hezekiah was the king of Judah, began his reign. So we see that Hezekiah began his reign, but I want to see what verse 2 says. It says, he was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And in verse 3, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. We see that Hezekiah comes into kingship at a very young age. He was 25 years old. Very similar to Solomon at the beginning of his, his reign when he was like, hey, I'm really young. I have no idea what I'm doing. And here we have Hezekiah coming into his, his throne at, seven, at 25 years old. And as Hezekiah comes there, we see the big thing that he did, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is a big deal when it comes to the kings. If you're a student of the Bible and you've read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, it's a very common thing to read did evil in the sight of the Lord. You'll see so-and-so king did evil in the sight of the Lord. And every once in a while, you get a glimmer of hope of one king that did good in the sight of the Lord. And this is who Hezekiah is. And one of the reasons I believe that Hezekiah did this was because Hezekiah didn't do what was right in his own eyes. We know that Israel has always had a problem because they're people of doing exactly what we like to do. Do what's right for us. 
Have you ever noticed you always do what's right for you generally? It's, it's kind of a fun thing. We love to do what's right for Craig. I hope all of you guys do what's right for Craig <laughs> at all times. But that's not really how we live. We live and we're like, oh, man, I'm going to be a little selfish and I'm going to do this. And then you throw in kingship. You throw in being a king. Guess where it's a lot easier to do what's right in your own eyes? As the king. We've all thought about it. You might even said it, this is my kingdom. And you look at your home. No one really thinks that's a kingdom except for you. And the truth is that that idea can immediately hurt us. But the great thing about Hezekiah is he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And we actually see that because we read in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4 and 5, if we continue reading, we see what he did. He, in verse 4, he removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images and broke the pieces of the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until these days, the children had burned incense to it. We see that the, the children of Israel have been worshiping idols. And right here, he comes in and he breaks them all down. He actually does something that David didn't do. He had, did something that Solomon couldn't do. He did something that none of these other kings, because we see that they've worshiped them from the time of Moses. He comes in and he breaks down all the altars. He breaks down everything. And in verse 5, it says, why? He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him of all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him, because he trusted in God. Now, why is it a big deal that Hezekiah is sitting here and he breaks down all the altars? that have been worshipped, the high places that have been sacrificed on year after year after year, it really is a big deal because it doesn't start with him having a lot of friends. If you go into people's lives and you change their altars, all of a sudden, they don't like you too much, right? It's funny the things that, that we have altars for. And yes, we, we always talk about altars of cars and money and all those things. But if you start destroying someone's stuff that they truly love over God, they kind of hate you. And this is what Hezekiah is doing. So right from the beginning, Hezekiah does something different from all the kings. He is not caring about what other people are saying about him. He is only looking to the Lord. But there's a second thing he's doing. And that is, he's living out what Solomon said to do in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 28. It says, a lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it. And a flattering mouth works ruin. That's the thing I want us to see. The flattering mouth. Hezekiah refused to listen to the flattering mouth, and he started to listen to what God said. And why he did this is a big deal, because we need to see why Hezekiah actually does that. And he listens to a prophet that had a very ugly thing to say to Israel. And that is found in Micah chapter 1. I know we're, ju we're jumping all over the place, but I want you guys to see this. Right here in chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 2. This is to Hezekiah. It says, hear all you people, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the, God, the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his high place. He will come down and, and tread on the high places of the earth. The mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will spit like wax before the fire, like water pours down a steep place, all this for the transgressions of Jacob and the sins of the house of Israel and the transgressions of Jacob. Is it not Samaria? And what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? This is Hezekiah's first year in ministry. First year as king. A prophet comes to him and says, oh, God's coming and he's going to tear 
you down. How many of you guys want that as your, uh, you know, yeah, you just got a new position, and then someone comes in saying, by the way, it's all going to burn. I think Hezekiah was a very wise man at this moment going, I'm a little scared of God. What does he not like? Oh, wait, the high places. He's actually, God comes out and warns both Israel and Judah. Both kings get this warning. And right here, Hezekiah is actually a man that gets to listen. And he listens to God. That is the most amazing thing about Hezekiah. He listens to the Lord. And as he listens to the Lord, he removes the high places. He actually fixes the temple. It continues to have temple services for the first time in many years. Hezekiah does all these things for the Lord right at the beginning of his ministry, of his kingship. But as Hezekiah is there, God continues to work. Because God told Hezekiah, by the way, bad things are going to happen to your kingdom. Did you notice that? He's going to come down on Israel and on Judah. Now, this is the thing that we need to know because Hezekiah is such a great guy that realistically we could look at him and say, oh man, he's never had a bad day in his life. That's really not true. He had the Assyrians come against him and they were about to die. So as the Assyrians come against Hezekiah. Hezekiah is hanging out in the city. There's a prophet named Isaiah with him. He's hanging out there going, oh, no, I'm about to die. The city's about to die. And he starts to freak out. How are we going to do this? And God delivers him in one of the most amazing battles of all time. God delivers him right here in 2 Kings 19, verse, 20, or verse 35. And this is with the Assyrians outside. And it says, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000. Now I'll read that again. 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, they were, there were the corpses all dead. Just in case you didn't get that, they were all dead. So this is what Hezekiah is in for. He has an army come against him, and God comes out, and the angel of the Lord goes and kills and wipes out the entire army that he built the tunnel for, which is awesome. Now, as Hezekiah the king, he's probably feeling pretty good about himself right now, don't you think? And this is something that I often see when we come to victories in, with God, victories that happen with us. We start to go, yeah, God, this is really cool. God must really love me. Have you ever felt that way? When you're sitting there and you're going, yeah, God loves me so much. But then all of a sudden, a storm comes, a battle hits, and now we get to actually get into our text. Right here, the battle just happened. Everything is moving. Things are going great for Hezekiah. And then we turn the page to chapter 20. And it says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. Oh, sickness and being near death. This is something that gets Christians. Did you know that? Most of us, when we get sick, we look at God and go, how could you? Don't you know who I am? I follow you. And here Hezekiah gets sick. Now, the truth is, I will tell you, sickness and death are part of life. Even for Christians, you don't meet many 150-year-old believers. And the reason that is, is because we still live in a fallen world. And Hezekiah is reaping the unfortunate benefits, which are not benefits at all, the curses of being in that fallen world. He's starting to get sick, and he's near death. And Isaiah the prophet shows up and went to him. And this is what he says to Hezekiah which is the most comforting thing you can ever say to someone that's sick. 
Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. How do you think Hezekiah is feeling at this moment? Here Isaiah is, the prophet that literally just said, oh, by the way, God's going to deliver you. And he, and he showed him how God wiped out an entire army in front of him within the angel of the Lord. And then right here, he gets sick, walks in the room, and he's probably like, Isaiah, good friend, please tell me I'm going to get better. And Isaiah looks at him and says, set your house in order. You're about to die. Now, this is actually the jumping off point of the story. Hezekiah is, has just been told what to do. And he has to sit there and go, how do you handle that? Hezekiah is a man that God did amazing things through. How does a man that God does great things through handle when he's sick? When he's in pain. Because the sad truth is, he's still a guy, and when I get sick, it's like a hundred times worse than when my wife gets sick. So this is a real sickness. How does he handle it? Right here, Hezekiah does something amazing. Then he turned and his face towards the wall and prayed to the Lord. Don't you love that? Isaiah says, hey, set your house in order. And what does he do? He rolls over, how many guys can relate to this, and stares at the wall and prays. I love praying to the wall. I know it's not going to talk back to me, and if it does, it's definitely God. So he's sitting here, and he starts to pray. And he does the right thing, right in the face of his worst nightmare of being sick, he's praying to the Lord. And this is his prayer. It's a beautiful prayer because right in verse 3 it says, remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He looks at God He's crying out to him. And the reason it's such a beautiful prayer is because it's an honest prayer. Remember me, God, I did what was right in your sight. He didn't sit there and sugarcoat it like many of us do, like I do often. I have a prayer, I'm like, God, well, if you really feel like doing this, I would appreciate it, right? He said that God going, remember me, I did what was right in your sight. Why are you forgetting me right now? It's coming from a place of brokenness. And as he's praying this prayer, we see that Isaiah is leaving. Right here in verse 4, it says, And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying. Now, there's two things I want to see. First of all, Isaiah didn't hang around to see Hezekiah die. It's a good thing, actually. And he started to leave. And he's walking out the door just going, all right, God, you're about to tell me who the next king is. His name is Manasseh, but that's okay. If you're going to tell me who that is. If we're, we have the work to do. He has to anoint him. He has all these different things to do. And right here, as he's walking out, the word of the Lord came to him saying, return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal, heal you on the third day. You shall go up to the house of the Lord. Wow. Could you imagine Isaiah at this moment? He gets to do an about face, walk back to Hezekiah and say, Good news. You're not going to die today. On the third day, you actually have to go up to the temple. And I love how God does this. He does it with such joy and passion. We see that God loves the people of the southern kingdom. By the way, he also loves the people of the northern kingdom. He loves them both. But he says, hey, you're going to live. But God takes it one step further. And this, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but it happens. 
In verse 6, it says, I will add to your days 15 years. How many of you guys want to know when you're going to die? Hezekiah got the privilege of, okay, 15 years. Now, we don't know if it was 15 years to the day of the third day when he was healed, but it was around 15 years, within that 15-year mark. So I will add to your, your days 15 years. I will deliver you and the city from the hands of the kings of the Syrians, and I will defend the city for my name's sake and for the sake of my servant David. So right here, Hezekiah gets added 15 years, and then God gives him an amazing promise. God will defend the city for those 15 years. Now, when you see an army get wiped out by an angel, are you doubting God can do that? No, he's probably sitting there going, sweet, I have 15 years of peace. This is awesome. But, we also have to see something that God says to Hezekiah. Why is God willing to defend the city? For his name's sake. Exactly, for his name's sake and for the sake of David. Does it say anything about for the sake of Hezekiah? No, God comes in and says, hey, I'm going to defend this city for my name's sake. And as God tells David this. Isaiah goes, all right, God, what do I do next? Then Isaiah said, take a lump of fig. So they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Isaiah gets a really amazing job here, doesn't he? God not only tells him that Isaiah gets to live, he also tells him how to heal the boil that apparently he was dying from by taking a lump of fig and putting it on it. Now, how does that work? No idea. But it worked. He starts to get healed. But Hezekiah, as this was all happening, was like, well, I don't live by the words of flattery. Remember that? He doesn't live by people saying, oh, I, you're just going to, the Lord told me you're going to get better. That could be just a lie. People lie all the time, right? People will tell you what you want to hear because we're afraid to tell the person what they don't want to hear. You don't want to tell the truth. Sometimes you're blessed with someone that will always tell you the truth and you sit there and you avoid them like the plague. You sit there and you're like, oh no, what did I screw up with today? It's a lot of fun to avoid that person. But Hezekiah was not one that would listen to just people, oh yeah, it's all good. So he was like, Isaiah, you're telling me that I'm going to get healed. By the way, you just told me I was going to die. Which one is it? Did God change his mind? Well, so how do I know? And this is what Hezekiah does. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, what is the sign that the Lord heals me? And I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day. So Hezekiah looks at, at Isaiah and goes, what sign are you going to show that this one is the real one? And Isaiah says in verse 9, this is the sign for you from the house or from the Lord. That the Lord will do the thing which he had spoken. Shall the shadow go forward 10 degrees or backwards 10 degrees? So Isaiah looks at, at Hezekiah and goes, okay, so God says he's going to give you a sign. The shadow either gets to go forward 10 degrees or backwards 10 degrees. You get to pick. Don't you love when you get to pick God's signs for you? He's really making it abundantly clear to Hezekiah that this is going to happen. So this is Hezekiah's response. And Hezekiah answered, it is an easy thing for the shadows to go down 10 degrees. I'm not sure how that's an easy thing, other than, you know, shadows can go down in, in, nat in nature normally. But according to Hezekiah, this was easy to make the earth change its axis and rotation. But that's okay. He says it's easy for it to happen. No, but let the shadows go backwards 10 degrees. So he's like, let's turn back time. There's a song in there or something. Don't we all want to turn back time? 
let it go back 10 degrees. Now, for Hezekiah's sake, this is really not that much time. He just has it go back. And so Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards, which it had gone down on the sundial. So here, Isaiah gets this word from the Lord, and God answers this prayer. Now, how many of us want to shut our Bibles right now and say, man, whew, lesson done. God answers prayers, and we get to walk out of here feeling all good about ourselves. I want to shut our Bi the Bible here and say, God will bless you and he'll heal you. And he can. But there's a huge problem with that. And that is, the story isn't over. This is where the story goes from Hezekiah being an amazing king, listening to the Lord, to something changing. And I want us to stop here because we need to stop at this moment because we see God do a miracle in Hezekiah's life. Right now, something is happening that is more amazing than anything. He is healed. And as soon as God starts doing something good, we can get complacent. Did you know that? We can immediately sit there and go, man, God is for me. Who could be against me? I'm good. And we can forget everything else. But that's not the case. Or that is the case for Hezekiah. And I don't want it to be the case for us. Because in verse 12, right after, it says, At the time, the king of Babylon sent a letter and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Now that's sweet. Oh, the king of Babylon. I mean, it's the king of Babylon. Do you know who the king of Babylon is? That guy. He sends a letter and a present to Hezekiah. And Hezekiah just went through everything he went through. He watched the sun change. He watched everything happen. And he's starting to feel good about himself. And he lets his guard down. It actually says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, this is what God warns us about letting our guard down. He said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So right here, God warns us with steadfast faith, unchanging faith, resist the devil. The hardest time to do that is when God works a miracle. We let our guard down. We bask in the glory. And we're sitting there going, well, the king of Babylon's given me presents. It's because of how great God is and how he works through me. And he sends his present. And we see how, Isaiah, or how Hezekiah responds. In verse 13, it says, And Hezekiah was attentive to them. Aren't you always attentive to people that give you things? Whew. Hezekiah is just a man. It's amazing. And he showed them all the house of his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ornaments, and all his armories, and all that was found among his treasures, there was nothing in the house or all of his domain that Hezekiah did not show them. He gives them a guided tour through his kingdom. Now, we have the privilege of knowing that Babylon takes over Judea. We know that Babylon takes them over, but Hezekiah doesn't have that privilege. He's not guarding himself. He's not watching out. What he's saying is, well, God did this. I'm going to show all of God's amazing things to my future enemy. Because he gave me good work. He gave me the words I wanted to hear. He gave me the presence I wanted to hear. We actually see 
that Hezekiah changes from not listening to flattering words to starting to listen to them. So he shows them this all. But there's still a prophet in Israel named Isaiah. Then Isaiah, the prophet, went to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say and from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, they came from the far country from Babylon. They came from way over there. They're not there to hurt us. And Isaiah says, what have, you, what have they seen in the house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. This is always a scary moment. When you're going out and you're basking in your glory, you're on your high horse, and then someone comes in like Isaiah and says, hear the word from the Lord, and you're like, uh-oh. That should be our response, right? But here is what the Lord says. Behold, the days are coming when all in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So right here, God says to Hezekiah, there's a day coming when Babylon's going to carry everything to Babylon. We should all be in fear. But God keeps talking. And it says, and they shall take away some of your sons who will be descended from you, whom you will beget, and they shall be eunuchs in the place of the king of Babylon. And Isaiah, Hezekiah, exhales. Why? See, most of us, when we said, thus says the Lord, hear what the Lord says, immediately had the response of, uh-oh, Hezekiah is about to be ripped a new one. Good, right? And God says, Babylon's going to come and take you away. He's going to take away your sons, though. And Hezekiah remembers what God said to him when he was healed. He's going to live in peace. He's going to live in harmony. So he Hezekiah's like, okay, that's my son's problem. And how do we know that? Because this is what Hezekiah says. So Hezekiah says to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you had spoken is good. Wait, your sons are going to be taken captive. The word is good. For he said, Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Hezekiah looks at Isaiah, who just warned him and said, Sweet, I'm still good. That's my son's problem. We need to pause here. This is a complete change in Hezekiah. In fact, David Guzik said this, Hezekiah has shown himself to be the, almost the exact opposite of other-centered person. He was almost totally self-centered. All he cared about was his own personal comfort and success. This is a transformation in Hezekiah. He didn't care about his sons. Now, I'm going to tell you that Hezekiah is sinning here. And this sin, even though he did great in the sight of the Lord, will carry Judah for generations. See, we don't know why Hezekiah hated his kids. We don't know why Hezekiah didn't care about the next generation. We don't know why Hezekiah, we don't know anything. But the truth is that Hezekiah was given a command from the Lord at the beginning of this chapter. It was set your house in order. 
And God gave him 15 years to do it. And after 15 years, he said, oh, well, at least I'm good. Hezekiah sin carried on beyond who he is. Because despite all the great things that Hezekiah did, all the great things that it says right here in verse 20, now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he had made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, they're not written in the book of the chronicles of the king of Judah. And Hezekiah rested with his father. That doesn't matter because the next thing is written. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. You see, Hezekiah forgot the thing that we always need to be looking forward to. And that is the future. That is the future of God's kingdom. No matter what, we cannot, despite where we're at in our lives, ever forget about the next people coming behind us. The truth is, I don't care if you're 60 or 16. If you're 16, start looking at those little uh, kids in Sunday school and going, man, you're coming up in the Lord. This is going to be awesome. You're going to be doing amazing things. This is where God wants Hezekiah to be. But Hezekiah refused to do it. And because of it, this is what's written about his son right here in chapter 21, verse 2. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And he rebuilt the high places. You see, I wished I could just shut the Bible and say, man, God's going to heal you. You're good. But the amazing thing is we didn't get to. The amazing thing about the Lord is that we actually see the consequences when we turn from worshiping him to being okay with ourselves and our own comfort. And we forget to do what the Lord asked us to do. He had 15 years with his son. Could you imagine what you can learn in 15 years? That is kindergarten through your junior year of college is 15 years. He could have taught him all about the Lord, but he did not. And it was all because he got comfortable where he was and he let his guard down. So I will end with this, and I'll tell you right now. God will answer prayers. God will answer your prayers. He will do miracles in your life, because that's who he is. He will do miracles in your life, even if you mess up so horribly after he does a miracle in your life, because he loves us. But when he does a miracle in our lives, when we sit there and when we worship him and say, God, man, you've done something so cool in my life. Remember, 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 remember to keep our guard up. Because as soon as God gives us a victory, another battle is waiting to attack us. And we do not want to fail especially when it comes to those we love and our duty to the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, hallelujah for you. Hallelujah for the fact that you are a God of miracles. You're a God that heals. You're a God that delivers. You're a God that fights our battles for us, Lord. And Lord, I ask that as you continue to do that in our lives, as you have not forsaken us, as you have not just left us to the wayside, Lord, that in those battles, we can continue to hold steadfast to you 
that we can continue to look to you even when the battle seems to be over, knowing that the devil is like a roaring lion waiting to devour us, Lord. And we can take strength that as long as we turn back to you, there you are. In Jesus' name.